So good afternoon, everyone. It is 12 on the dot, and I want to really start without uh, much ado. Uh, you are welcome to our biweekly presentation at the Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies of the National Open University of Nigeria. I dare to say it's been a very wonderful time being here throughout the year. And today's presentation is going to be the last presentation for 2022. And we'll be back in January before the end, by middle January thereabouts, we shall advertise the other presentations that will come on next year, God willing. So we want to say this is a big way to finish our presentation this year, because we are having the biggest coming last. And I know that uh, it's going to be really exciting. So on behalf of our vice chancellor at the National Open University of Nigeria, Professor Olufemi Peters, I welcome you all to today's uh, presentation, which I'm sure we are all going to enjoy. I want to say specially to the presenter, a special message, and I was asked, deliver, deliver, I said, I will try. And I want to do it straight away to say, Professor Emeritus Sogolo sent his apology to the presenter specifically, that he's gone for a medical appointment. And if he finished on time, he would still try to log on to this presentation. And you know that Professor Sogolo is one of those who is always here and enjoys being with us on this platform. So having said that, I want to just make a quick uh, uh, introduction of our center. Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies was uh, established in 2020, February, at about the time that the lockdown was beginning in our country and perhaps in the whole world for COVID. And the center has been uh, waxing strong and dealing with migration issues as well as global studies. So it's not only migration. Even if you have something to present on this platform that is not about migration, but about global issues, we know them. So many of them, climate change, what have you, so many diseases here and there that we want to talk about. Anything that affects the global community generally is welcome on this platform. And uh, our main, uh, let me quickly tell you, our core values include them. Um, integrity, inclusion, diversity, service, and participatory. And our mission is uh, really to uh, look at uh, migration issues as it affects the whole world, not only our country, and global issues, like I've said earlier. And the core mandates are to provide leverage for fee-based and solution-driven research, to serve as agent of national policy for migration studies, as well as global studies, to seek grants for academic activities and outreach for sustainability, to publish and sustain peer-reviewed academic journal and monograph series, to collaborate with stakeholders in the field and policy makers, to organize occasional seminars, conferences, and public health lectures. So we are looking uh, critically at the possibility of having a, a public health uh, a public um, lecture, rather, um, in a, a, a public conference in the coming year. I also want to say that in the area of a journal presentation, our second uh, episode for this year, that is volume two, issue two, is going to be online before the end of this week. We send a broadcast to you because it's ready. We are now going to put it online, if not today, by tomorrow. So you can have all the uh, articles there online, and then the print co copy is uh, in process. We are going to, like I said, the e-copy e e is going to be online between now and tomorrow by God's grace, and the print copies will also come out and will be sent to all our editorial board members and our authors. So that is the last uh, issue for the year. We have two issues a year, April and November, but the one of November is the one that is coming out now, the in the, in the end of the first week in December. And uh, I think it's not too bad because of the logistics involved. Having said that about our center, I think, uh, and that's just in about five minutes, I'm done with our center. Let us go to today's presenter and presentation. Let me start by introducing our presenter. I must say I have here a formidable CV of this erudite scholar. 
and I will try to do justice to it. However, I hope you will pardon me if there are some omissions, because I must say the CV is already a textbook itself, and that is why she's here to share her knowledge with us. Um, professor Helen Ochuko Kwanashi is a professor of pharmacology and a guardian's counselor. She has a background of BSc and MSc biochemistry from that great university, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. She obtained her PhD from Hamadou Bello University, Zaria, and undertook postdoctoral training at the University of Dundee in the United Kingdom, and attained full professorship of pharmacology in 2004. She had also earned two education qualifications from Amadou Bello University, namely postgraduate diploma in education and higher diploma in guidance and counseling. A, a, a Professor Kwanashi, a, a career academic, she has been teaching and researching in the university setting for four decades from May 1982 and mostly at the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Amadou Bello University, with face-to-face -face settings for four decades. However, from August 2021 to date, she's been employed with an open and distance learning setting at the National Open University of Nigeria uh, in Abuja. And she is in the Department of Nursing Science, Faculty of Health Sciences. And this uh, presentation is hinged primarily on the exciting outcome of that migration from face to face to open and distance learning. You can imagine that she is a great woman to be able to come into that kind of learning after almost four decades of teaching. And she's coping beautifully, I must say. Panache's career at Amadou Bello University was unbroken between 1982 and, 20, and July 2021, during which period she concurrently served at different times as visiting professor of pharmacology to Usma Danfodio University, Sokoto, Kaduna State University, um, Kaduna uh, University of uh, Kaduna and University of Sierra Leone, Freetown. She had also spent three sabbatical leaves at the University of Dundee in Scotland from 1993 to 1994, Niger Delta University in Bayesa State, 2007 to 2008, and Delta State University, Abraka, 2014 to 2015. So our, our professor has really had a swell time in the academia. Her principal areas of specialization are perinatal biochemical pharmacology, toxicology, and pharmacology education with interfacing interests in disease conditions that are prevalent in the tropics and developing worlds such as malaria, HIV, AIDS, and sickle cell disorder. Kwanache is a drosophilist. In the last three years, she switched her research model from mammalian systems, that is principally mice and rats, where what she was dealing with before, to the highly versatile fruit fly, Drosophilia melan melanogaster, for which purpose she established Quanash Drosso Lab as a private research laboratory and the backbone of Drosophilia Academy, Abuja. She is the treasurer of the African Society for Drosophilia Research, and she is a committed advocate of widespread use of Drosophilia across disciplines for research for research, teaching, and testing, etc. Kwanashe has supervised 94 research-based projects, 52 MSc dissertations, and 19 PhD theses, and has over 150 diverse publications as peer-reviewed journal articles, official conference proceedings, book chapters, pharmacology-based art exhibition, etc. at Amadou Bello University, she has several been named outstanding lecturer and best lecturer in pharmacology. This is a very notable uh, commendation. 
Our presenter of today has served as external examiner at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels, an external assessor of candidates being considered for promotion to the professorial cadre in several universities in and outside Nigeria. As team leader, as team member or leader, Panache is a pharmacologist, has also participated in the resource verification and accreditation exercises of the National Universities Commission. A highly sought out speaker, Panache has delivered keynote addresses and lead lectures at pharmacology conferences within and outside the country. Professor Kanache has received many scholarships and prestigious awards, among which are fellowships from the federal government, University of Ibadan, and University of Dundee, Scotland, UK. The postdoctoral research award from the Wellcome Trust in 1993, Teaching Excellence Award in 2024, from the education section of the International Union of Basic and Clinical Pharmacology and Pharmacology Educator Award by the Division for Pharmacology Education of the American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics in 2017. You can see the list is endless. Let me just take a breath because I cannot continue. It's endless, like I said. In addition, she was a member of editorial boards of several journals, including West African Journal of Pharmacology and Drug Research, Egyptian Journal of Basic and Clinical Pharmacology, Farm Advances, and so on and so forth. The list continues. Professor Kanache is a past president, fellow of the West African Society of Pharmacology, fellow of the British Pharmacological Society, and a counselor on the 2018-2022 uh, on the Executive Committee of the International Union of Basic and Clinical Pharmacology. In her private life, she's happily married to Professor Michael Kwanashi, renowned economist and former Vice Chancellor of Veritas University, Abuja, and they are blessed with children and grandchildren. Today, she will be speaking to us on migration of a career academic from face to face to open and distance learning a personal narrative with generic implications so join me to welcome this erudite scholar to this platform and a very beautiful one to end the year with on this our center of excellence in, inter, uh, in the migration and global studies. I welcome you, Ma, Professor Kwanashi. Over to you. You are welcome, Ma. A very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you can see, that's me. And those who don't know me, who already know me, you can recognize me. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, the director, Dr. Gloria Aneto, for kindly extending an invitation to me to be on the speaker chair uh, this Wednesday. Uh, previously, I do my best to attend these sessions. It's one of my favorite programs at the National Open University of Nigeria. And uh, I've always enjoyed the discourse on this platform. I would also like to express my appreciation to the director of the Distant Learning Center here at Amadou Bello University, where I'm currently seated it's my alma mater for the postgraduate diploma in education program, which I undertook between 2018 and 2020. I would like to recognize, uh, if they are present, the current vice chancellor of NOUN, Professor Olufemi Peters, and the immediate past vice chancellor, Professor Abdallah, who is always on this forum. I hope he's here today. And uh, also to thank all the members of the audience, both from NOUN, from across the country, and from outside uh, Nigeria. We are all most welcome. Um, I want to thank the director again for her very kind words. And she asked, we both agreed that I will speak on migration of a career academic from face to face to open and distant learning. That was my choice when she requested that I should, I should speak. And it's going to be a personal narrative that I hope has generic implications. This is a picture of our lovely headquarters located at Jabi in Abuja. I bring you greetings from there. 
regardless of where I am in the world, whether in Zaria or outside the country, this is home, it's my workplace, and I'm very much proud of it. So I believe that some declarations are in order. I want you to consider this presentation as a satire and as a historical fiction. The reason being that I was unable to reach everybody whose images will appear here and whose names I will mention. So I don't have a lot of permissions and I don't want anybody to sue me to cut. So if you see anybody that looks like somebody or any name that looks like your name or somebody that you recognize, please, uh, it's possible that it's just a coincidence. I have no conflict of interest whatsoever. So you can see my presentation is loaded. I have 20 items, beginning from the introduction of the protagonist and ending with a jackpot invite to you and all those who are listening. Let's meet the protagonist. And I have to warn you, you know, I am the speaker. I have a story to tell and I'm telling it in the third person. So sometimes I know I, I will slip my tongue and we use I or us or we, you have to pardon me. But I'm actually talking about this lady whose avatar you can see shown here on the screen. I will not go into all these details, except that she's female. She was assigned female at birth and she's female by choice. She's in her late, 30, late 60s. She's a career academic and she's proudly Nigerian. I'm not going to go through all of these things on the screen. Just suffice to add that her ethnicity and religion are not declared here because they are irrelevant to most of our discourses in Nigeria. We are all on the same level. I should say that there is no antagonist on this story. And in summary, our protagonist is a pharmacologist. She's a boarding drosophilist, not a full-fledged drosophilist. She's a guidance counselor. She's a collaboration champion. She is a gender advocate and practitioner. She's a mentorship promoter. She's a literary writer, a poet, and a comedian. So some of us have been coming here. So we understand a bit and maybe a lot about migration. But I recognize that some of you are here for the first time. So I think it is OK to take one minute and do a crash program, a crash course, crash micro course on migration basis. Migration, we can define as an umbrella term. It covers so much. But we, the lay person, understand to be of the movement of a person from his or her place of usual residence, whether within a country or across international borders, whether it is temporary or permanently, and for a variety of reasons. So that is the broad definition we shall use. Even international law has this understanding, although not any specific definition. And we are not going to delve into the subject of uh, migration. I think NOUN should start offering certificates, diploma, and even degree programs of migration studies, but that is another story. I will just mention the types of migration that exist, the reasons for migration, and the consequences. Internal migration is within a country or within a state. So if you were to move, for example, from say um, Zaria to Abuja, it may be considered internal migration. If you were to move also from face to face, which is FTF to ODL, which is open and distant learning, that would constitute internal migration. Then there's also external migration, which is moving across states or across uh, countries. Some people say continental or international migration. Then when you leave one country to move to another, we describe that as immigration, emigration, then you have immigration, which is movement into the country. We have counter urbanization, and of course the age long rural to urban migration, usually not the other way around. And then today I'm going to talk about career or academic migration. There are many reasons for migration, and I'll just list a few here. Some of it is for, to seek economic opportunities, join family, for better education, to escape conflict as a response to disasters like farming. And there are other miscellaneous reasons. Medical tourism is one of it and cultural practices. If you have an illness which, which does not permit you to thrive in a particular environment, you may desire to change location. 
And then the consequences of migration can be pleasant, but they can also be dire. So we talk about challenges and threats. I'm going to mention some of those towards the end of this discussion and of the happiness and contentment that can follow as a consequence of migration. These images and this slide is about ABU, one of the most profound universities, not only in this country or Africa, but even in the world. This is the gate. While I worked here for almost 40 years, my office is somewhere here. And then this is the distant learning center, my alma mater for the postgraduate diploma in education. And the migration route that I'm going to talk about today is from Zaria to Abuja. Um, we should know that ABU is a federal university, one of the first generation university and then uh, it says is the largest and most extensive of all universities in sub-Sahara Africa. This was my point of, sorry, this was the point of the protagonist uh, departure. And I can tell you so much about ABU. I can spend a whole 20 minutes talking about this great university. But I decided I would highlight some things in red 16 faculties, which is a lot. That's double the number of faculties we have at NOUN, 98 academic departments, six institutes, 12 specialized centers, a school of postgraduate studies, a business school, center of excellence, a college of medical sciences, a teaching hospital, their teaching hospital, distant learning center, and the list goes on. And then I should also say that 68 universities in the North plus the federal capital territory are uh, mentee institutions of ABU. That is how great the university is. Plus the fact that I obtained my PhD here and I became a professor of pharmacology in this institution. There are some statistics here. Total undergraduate population is about 60,000. And you can compare that to NOUN, which has a total number of about 600,000 enrollees. There is some difference there too. So this is the place our protagonists emigrated to the National Open University of Nigeria, N-O-U-N. It's proudly now, you know what now is, the name of any person, place, or thing, let's not go there. I will spend 30 minutes on that. But in this slide, I've tried to summarize some important things about these great institutions. So basic information and statistics, including the vision, the mission, the fact that we have now 103, maybe 100 active study centers, 116 active programs, 2,538 courses. And then I have some statistics here that show the total number of enrolled students and the total number of active, not just enrolled, active and registered. So you can see huge figures like 686,766 uh, uh, individuals enrolled. Now, I should say that these statistics came from the MIS and within the last one month. So they are very current. And like I always do, I requested for them to be disaggregated by sex. So you can see that enrolled students, the male were higher. But when you want to look at students who are actively registered, the female are higher. There can be some story to that, but that is for another day. Then the figures are in red, are the ones that have been unable to update. So these ones are not very current, so we won't pay attention to them. But I want to draw your attention to a major difference between ODL and the ABU, which is the mode of teaching and instructional delivery methods. We use open and distant learning. I will mention that or describe that in a short while. We use printed and online course materials, instructional videos, online facilitation, work zonal laboratories, mobile labs, and more recently, virtual laboratories. Some of the slides I will have to flash them because I have a limited number of, of time to speak. But let me tell you what our protagonist has done. Having spent 400 and, 470 months in her place of first appointment, ABU, from May 1982 to July 2021, she has calculated that she has spent 16 months at ODL and calculated an, a face-to-face -face and open and distant learning ratio of almost 30 to one, if she were to retire as at this moment. But if by God's grace, she stays on to the retirement age of May, 2025, this ratio will now be 
because she will still have spent 470 months in ABU and 46 months in now. Now, this is important because she has as her vision and her mission to do in these three and a half years she will be in now, what she did in the 40 years she was in Zaria. It's a tall order, but you cannot uh, underrate her. So let's begin from her interest in education. This dated back as far back as 1989 or earlier than that, when she discovered that organizing practicals for large classes was problematic. In AB, when we talk about large classes, we are talking about 50 students in each particular class. Because I have usually about 150 in a class, and then they come in three, three days, three batches in the week. So my large class was like 50 students. So I was in a conference in the UK, and somebody came and was describing a, an adjustment he made to his practical, and the whole room was clapping. I said, what? In Zaria, we make this adjustment every day. Your students will be milling in front of you. The technologists will come and whisper, Ma, we don't have pen to bab. And right there and then, you have to change your practical. Still achieve the same objective or a similar objective and progress. So I came back and called my younger colleagues, George, who may be listening in from South Africa, and Aota, who is in the US. I said, this thing we are doing every day is publication. And that's how we did our first paper, Factors Modifying Duration of Drug Action, a practical for large undergraduate classes on limited laboratory space, staff, and budget. It was published in the journal Medical Education in 1989. And I can tell you that as far as recent as 2017, we still have the same problem or similar problems. We've used different skills to solve them, but they keep arising and we are still battling. Student numbers are increasing, resources are reducing. And so at the American Society for Pharmacology, and experimental therapeutics. A new team of mentees, all professors now, you have Professor Luriche, Professor Ijofo, and Professor Anafi, who do practicals together, describe to the international pharmacology community about effective engagement of large numbers of undergraduate students in pharmacology practicals, in resource poor settings, in Nigerian experience. Some of the problems are similar, but there are whole new sets of problems. And both resource poor countries and the more advanced countries are interested in how we solve these problems. And this, this particular poster is published in FACEP Journal. Then as recent as three months ago, that's September 13th to 14th, again, we had another uh, presentation, this time from ODL perspective, evaluation of virtual pharmacology lab. And that's me here, Dr. Elizabeth Jusashe, who is my head of department, Dr. George Annie and Dr. Frank Ebodahi. Uh, that's in my head of department. They are, he, she is the head of department of the protagonist. I don't know these guys, so nobody should take me to court. But the protagonist is not new to open and start learning. As far back as 2012, as president of the West African Society for Pharmacology, that's her here, she organized an integrative and organ system pharmacology in Abuja. The workshop took place at Nypreet, and this is a group picture of the workshop participants. And during one of the sessions, on two occasions during the program, we had an ODL setting, whereby some of the lecturers, this is Douglas and Tian and their PhD students, were in South Africa, and we were in the lab in Nypreet, Abuja, and they were able to connect with us using e-conferencing facility of Adobe Connect. I know today that doesn't look like anything, but in 2012, it was a fit. And we saw the potential there that we can use internet facilities for capacity building and continuing professional development on the African continent. And we did exploit that for a while. Here you have Sheku from Sierra Leone, she's from Ghana, and Fidelis is a, almost a prof now from Nigeria. So three countries in West Africa and one in South Africa did this 10 years ago. That is, the protagonist was already migrating even within the face-to-face -face setting in which she was working. 2013, the protagonist was in South Africa for a conference. And during the process, she learned about the flipped classroom. I will not have time to describe it, but it's like flipping, literally flipping upside down with the head down. 
whereby students engage in most of the work at home and they use the classroom for setting for discussion for workshop style of training. And I came home 2013 and practiced that over three semesters with my class. Initially, I started with 10% of my class and then the maximum I ever did was 25%. Because I didn't want to be accused of not teaching. Because flip classroom, you give them resources online, physical, and the students go and study on their own. Then you come to class, you divide them into groups, and you generally what many people may call gist. So I was careful. And at that time, I don't normally work alone, but you can see that I was trying to maintain um, sense and sensibilities within my face-to-face -face environment. So after the third semester, I now evaluated the students' perception of how they see the flipped classroom as a teaching learning modality compared to the regular mode of teaching, lecturer, uh, student side in a face-to-face -face setting. Mind you, this is a variant of open and distant learning. So a flipped classroom experience and development of the inquiry learner in a Nigerian family school. This was presented in a conference in Durham in the United Kingdom, and I won the best poster prize at that conference is the certificate of award. It came with some monetary uh, value attached to it, uh, which enabled the protagonist and her guy to register for the Improving University Teaching Conference in the following year. The conference registration is not cheap. It's upward of $600 for each person. And this is not the kind of evaluation. I need to say this. Here you have a panel of four or five. Everybody in the conference booths you pick a sticker and you stick it on the poster that you feel is the best poster. And at the end of the day, this poster was the best poster. The reason is that they found that my poster outlined, this is the, you won't see it here now, outlined 14, 14 disadvantages of the fleet classroom. And like they explained to me, they've had the fleet classroom as a conference theme in IUT, Improving University Teaching, for three consecutive times. And they are always singing his praises and everything, and nobody talks about the disadvantages. Everybody was exclaiming, how did you get this 14? I said, my students generated the table. Students must be very clever. Since then, I started respecting my students the more. Then I had a brief stint teaching in uh, Kaduna State University as a visiting lecturer. And I have some personal ODL and e-learning experiences there, all of this before the COVID-19 and before uh, migrating to NOUN. Did I say I? I don't, I don't know about these people, or the protagonists did. Anyway, this was an impromptu photograph of, this, of the students at Kaduna State University using IT facilities for their group study and their individual study. They didn't know I was coming. I was uh, transitioning actually between Abuja and, uh, and uh, Zaria, and I stopped over because we needed to organize some, some classes. And up at that time, this was, uh, this was 2017. These pictures were taken in 2017. So this was before 2017. I was already teaching medical students, these students, via Zoom call meeting platform. Three years, even four years before COVID-19. And how, do, how did that happen? The head of the department at the time, who was also my senior colleague from ABU, we, he just called me, Helene, I get this urgent, I have to go to Lagos. And uh, these students, so you know, they don't have time. Move. It will miss their lectures for three weeks, three days. You have to come and teach them. I said, I can't come and teach them. I have my work in ABU. I'm just visiting you people. But I know what I will do. I will teach them by Zoom. Smart children, there are about 30 in the class. And that was when I started teaching using module, using a, a Zoom facility, free at that time for 40 minutes. Etc. 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 Let's zoom up to this is 2018, 2017, 2018. I've been working with uh, Professor Michael Kwanashi, and we actually did this study for a conference in Australia, but our visas did not come on time. It was about creating and utilizing emerging new spaces for learning, because both of us know that brick and mortar were fading away, and that we have to do uh, something in this country. We travel a lot. I go for a lot of conferences. And yes, before COVID, the outside world was already doing e-learning and using Zoom and using such platforms for teaching. Distance education was coming on. It's just that uh, COVID-19 escalated it. So we studied ABU as federal university 
Cardona State University as state university, Nile University and Veritas University as private universities. So see the challenges that we would face in Nigeria if we were to conduct, if we were to create and utilize emerging new spaces. So we didn't go to Australia. So we reworked the paper to have a pharmacology flavor. At that time, I had started a series with some of my colleagues too, sometimes alone, on pharmacology education at Ahmad Bello University Zaria. This was the fourth edition. And because it's pharmacology, we flipped authorship and it was presented at the British Pharmacological Society Conference of 2018. I've shown this slide, not because I presented it at the conference, but it was selected for an award competition. Six of us, uh, it was chosen as a, the best for oral presentation and we did a competition. I did not win, but I thought that this audience may want to know that. Then let's go to Kyoto, Japan. This was still in 2018. In fact, this took place before the earlier one. In July, we had the 18th um, World Congress of Pharmacology in Kyoto. And the Congress organizers, they negotiated for conference participants to have these very sophisticated software called Pharmacopicos, which provides efficient learning and better understanding of practical pharmacology. You can use it to simulate a lot of experiments on the heart, on the ileum. You can carry out experiments repeatedly without the use of animals. $200 for Nigeria. Most of us went there with our own money. So only a few people were able to buy. Actually, I did not buy this. I bought Goodman and Gilman, which was sold also for about $300. That's the textbook of pharmacology, a blue one. Every time you have this edition, you have to get it and put it on your shelf. If you don't have it, you are not a respected pharmacologist. So I buy a new one every five years. Anyway, my colleague uh, was able to buy one. Uh, I, I won't mention his name, but he had a Tedford grant, which is why Tedford grant is very useful. And the alert came while we were there. So he shared it with me. I used it a couple of times. And that $200, was a subsidized rate for conference attendees for one year. You can imagine that it is not sustainable, particularly now. So when I came to NUUN, the migration and the metaphysics is continuing. The head of the Department of Nursing Science, we are physically based, came up with the idea of virtual pharmacology laboratory. It wasn't new to me. Because when I go to conferences, I behave like a student. 5.30, I've had my bath, I'm sitting on my bed, waiting to go to the conference. Because those registration fees we pay in dollars, I make sure I milk all the benefits from them. So I have known about virtual labs before, so I have not had my hands on it. So the virtual lab that was introduced in the Department of Nursing Science for biomedical subjects like anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, pharmacology, pathology, and microbiology enabled me to put this in practice. The picture you have here is actually taken in ABU where we are video shooting for a virtual pharmacology lab because we didn't have a pharmacology lab in, in, in uh, NOUN. So I, we developed, the protagonists developed some of these uh, uh, practicals here in ABU and developed the other ones at the University of Abuja in Gwagwalada in the Department of Pharmacology. Here you will see uh, Mr. Mohammed Umar, very, very uh, uh, nice, Technologist, he helped me even in my immediate post uh, PhD times, and is always, in fact, is well respected. I should mention his name. So that is how we we did all together seven practicals. We did four here and three in 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 Abuja at the University of Abuja. An example of collaboration between the institutions to you know, to help a third institution, as the case may be. So open and distal learning, I have the definitions here. I'm not going to go through this. My eyes on my watch. The reason I put everything in the slides is because I know that the director likes to share the slides and you have the opportunity to look at this again. What I want you to take home is that education, ODL is education provided outside the normal classrooms using any other media to allow for flex. So um, the protagonist is in NOUN and it's in the environment of open and distant learning terminologies. And they learned all of this stuff, blended learning, distant education, distant learning, hybrid learning, it's a whole lot of, 
a whole lot of everywhere I talk about ODI, I say, I say we have to streamline our definitions. But some of these things don't make sense. Anyway, distant education and distant learning, they mean the same thing. The ones with the same color, you can see that they are twin, they are twins, eh? but different, different uh, names, so to speak. The definition I gave previously on open and distant learning. I got from here. I compiled them. I didn't remove this from anybody. anybody. I compiled them in trying to understand the environment in which now physically I'm in, whereas for 10 years previously, I've delved into it, I've applied it, I've, I've preached it, I've utilized it with my students, both at undergraduate level and postgraduate level, not only in ABU, but even in the Kaduna State University. So the protagonist is here in and has, has had 16 months experience of teaching at this university. So two things, two things bother the, uh, the protagonist when she started teaching at NUN, and that is the facilitation, the student's perception of the facilitation, as well as the virtual pharmacology lab that she and her team have created. She wanted to see how effective that would be in teaching and learning. So she got together her research team to investigate the, the, the facilitation. Why did we need to do this? The university is always singing the praises of online facilitation. Oh, the students are doing better now. Oh, this is the best thing that happened to ODL. And yet she goes into class. By the way, my student population in the student population in FT, FTF was about 150 marks. But in, at NOUN, a student population in the Department of Nursing Science is upward of 3,500. That is students enrolled for the course. And I teach, the protagonist teaches. If I say I again, please just shut me down, director. The protagonist teaches both pharmacology, biochemistry, and education courses. And this is one of the things I love about NOUN. So based on my qualifications, my up to master's level for biochemistry, PhD level for pharmacology and the postgraduate diploma in education. I was able to teach nursing students uh, those programs, but that is a digression. What I really wanted to say is that we investigated, the protagonists and the colleagues investigated facilitation as a teaching modality and, at NOUN. And apart from the student surveys, we also did a key informant interview of the COCO of facilitation at NOUN Dr. Adeshina Adewale, who we ask tough questions. Why the students are not coming to class and how they can benefit irrespective of that. I can tell you that the results were eye-opening. This is not the time to, to discuss them, but that and the evaluation of the pharmacology lab we have both presented at the British Pharmacological Society meeting three months ago, and we are among the abstracts selected for publication by the society. We needed to evaluate the pharmacology lab. So we got a cohort of students. These are MSc students who have done wet lab for their projects at undergraduate level from different institutions. And then we gave them the opportunity to participate in the virtual pharmacology lab by releasing the video to them. Anyway, I won't give the details of the methodology. But we found that the virtual pharmacology lab that was evaluated was found by them to be useful for teaching and learning. I want you to take note of this, this series that has started now because it's important. Teaching and learning in Nigeria's only 100% open and distant learning university. One, that's the facilitation one. Two, that's the virtual pharmacology lab one. They were going to have a three. It doesn't have to be pharmacology, but it must have to do with ODL within NOUN. I know that there are 13 odd universities that NUC has given approval to, to run distance education courses or programs, but it's not the same thing. In this university, 100%, this is our job. This is what we do every day when we go to work. So that's teaching. I also want us to have a little look quick at research at NOUN and the experience of the protagonists. I will just give you a little statistics of 32, research grants approved by Senate that were given in February this year. And another number, 30 something or about 40, I can't remember the exact figure, were also given later this same year, 
So within one year, we had about 70 research grants distributed across the faculties in an even manner. Can you see? No discrimination of any sort across departments and across faculties within the university. So here you can see the vice chancellor, Professor Femi Peters, inaugurating the Sydney research grants and 32 research projects in that first tranche. And he's the one seated here. This is the deputy vice chancellor, TIR, Technology, Innovation and Research, Professor Malara Olaniyi. And this is the director of Directorate of Research Administration, Professor Joseph Omada. They are the ones that made it happen. And it's going on. And in March, there's going to be another call. This is what we call academic excellence. And it's happening at research at NOUN. Now, as one of the recipients of those grants, my group and I, you've met the Potanitanis group, Dr. Elizabeth Joseph Shehu, you have met uh, Dr. George Annie. There's a third, a very active young uh, researcher, Dr. Iwama Obose. And we are looking at undergraduate final year projects. So we call ourselves FIT in the National Open University of Nigeria's Faculty of Health Sciences. We like charity to begin at home. So we are looking at years from six years, six semesters, not years, six semesters from 2019 to 2021. And the results are amazing. The, the research in progress, and we feel that by January, this will be out and everybody will see what is not, what is good, what is excellent, what is not so good, and how we can improve on final year projects within the university to the betterment of the students, the betterment of their supervisors, as well as the end users, the people who will employ them in the market outside. Now we've talked about, we've seen a little bit about research, about teaching and the protagonist experiences at NOUN. In this slide, I'm showing a mix of teaching and research. This photograph was taken at the Science, Technology and Innovation uh, Expo of 2022. It took place at the Popular Eagle Square. And the, one of the products that was showcased by our university, our university had 11 products. I, won't, I don't care anymore whether I use I or protagonist. Our university had 11 products showcased at that expo. So yeah. I was talking about the joy that the faculty, the pride and the joy we felt at this achievement. I would like to mention that the best graduating student at the last convocation, which was the 11th convocation of NOUN, was also from the Department of Nursing Science. Okay, I want to say, just spend two lives talking about Drosophila Laboratory, just two slides. I'm not going to go beyond that. Let me tell you, this, this insects, this image you see here, beautiful image showing the colors of the rainbow was taken from the camera and the dissecting microscope of Quanage Drosso Lab. And this is, that microscope and, uh, and camera is one of, of two, we are having a pair of that and several other equipment that are coming to us this month or in January, because management has approved the, the setting up of Drosophila Laboratories at NOUN earlier in the year, but it's coming live now in December this year. And behind the scene, these were the people who have been working. The protagonists, Professor Indie, Professor Uchendu, Professor Dr. Ebodage, Dr. Aneto, Dr. Ajani, Dr. Alabi, Dr. Ogoko, Mr. Boniface, he is the technologist, and Mrs. Sanusi, who is the secretary. These are the planning committee, and they've done an excellent job, and you can expect things to happen. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you, the Josephila Laboratories, not laboratory, at the National Open University, will be the, will be the pivotal place in this country in the next few years. Just watch out. We already have strong collaboration arrangements with University of Jos. It's not in writing yet. We are wanting to do that with also the University of Abuja, of um, Ibadan. They have been advising us what we want a memorandum of understanding and active collaboration. And we're also in the process of discussing with the Open University, which in a way is different because we are both open.
two universities, we, we have our peculiarities in how we interface Josephila into research in our institutions. You can look forward to next year. I'm not going to stop the slides about, about research in now without talking about the Faculty of Health Sciences Research Committee. I send the invitations out for the seminar. So people stop me and talk to me all the time. But these are the people behind the scenes. Professor Indie, Professor Dr. Uchendu, Dr. Frank Ebodage, and Mrs. Christy Wanka. These are members of the Faculty Research Committee. And these are other people that help us. The Dean, Professor Shehu Adamu, the Deputy Deans, Professor Indie, and recently Professor Bishaku. You know, they, are, they lead the faculty, I mean, it's a faculty committee. And then we have received technical support from Mr. Mr. Ubaba. And even from the SEMS staff, all the way, Mr. John Adebi. And that is the secret. Every month without fail, from when we started in February to date, we have our seminars well organized. I just want you to know that to organize seminars on ongoing research projects and other topics of interest is just one of our nine terms of references. We've had our last meeting for the year and we did a scorecard and we looked at the monitoring and evaluation form that participants at the seminars fill and give to us. And you can expect changes in the new year that will make this even a better. Let's talk about gender. I say I'm a, I'm a highly gender. In fact, I, I, I call it admit to being a feminist with a bot, a feminist with a bot. But there is a gender at a now, gender at now program, not program, group in this university. It's a small group of mostly female and some male teaching staff that are keen on seeing both structural and functional gender presence across NOUN. They've started working. They have the loftiest ideas you can think of. And because of my experience in ABU, as a member of a six, a six member group that was largely behind the setting up of the gender policy unit, there's a lot we are, we are set to achieve. We are interested in making pink equal to blue, in interrogating differences in responsibilities and even what type of employment people should have. We think everybody should be going higher and we want to interrogate also the hurdles that people face, whether they are real or imaginary, whether for teaching or not teaching staff, whether for students, whether for the environment, whether within now or outside. That's the, that's the best I can tell you. The other things you have to wait in the new year. 2023 is going to be really exciting for everyone at NOUN. So the protagonist has a gender background. I've told you a bit of it. And you can see this reflected in this. This is actually, uh, this is a miniature version of an art exhibition, which she took part in in 2001 in the Art and Culture Center here in Abuja from Zaria. You know, she created, she had this concept that women and young children are frequently excluded from the use of drugs. You know now, you buy any medicine, not to be used in pregnant, avoid use during lactation. It's used in children has not been evaluated. Why? That's the question. But that is a debate for another day. And here you have the medical doctor, you have this laboratory scientist, and you have various dosage formulations being kept away from women and children. And this is a body of water, and you can see the boat. Despite officially being kept away, this boat is smuggling the same drugs to these women. So she writes a poem. She says, women and young children, therapeutic exiles, to whom most drugs are first denied, then smuggled. Who speaks for women and children? That is the cross of the matter. And so in her inaugural lecture, she addressed recalling therapeutic exiles and asked the question, who speaks for women and children? And traced her, her, her research experience from undergraduate days right up to PhD and postdoc to show that she has been consistent in speaking for women and children by, by the output of her work. And even on this occasion, she instituted uh, prizes for female undergraduate students, both in medicine and pharmacy, and research grants for both male and female postgraduate students to 100,000 Naira every year for 10 years. 
At that time, it just amounted to 1.5 million. But at that time, in 2014, the value was $10,000. Now we talk about collaboration. The first one, the protagonist started was with the University of Nairobi. You know that attrition rate is very high. I just showed you some figures. And when we say that a quarter of Nigerian students who enroll in the university belong to now, they are our students. But out of that over 600,000 students, less than 200 are active. Let me just finish our exam now. We find that less than 200,000, not 200, are actually active students. So the attrition rate is very high. It's not only in now, in all open and distant learning institutions. But there's something we can do about it, particularly if you now have a background of counseling. We can employ online counseling. We can even do research to find out, first of all, what the causes exactly are. Why is there a high attrition rate? Not generally, but for our own students. Why are they not completing their study program? And is there a gender difference between this? How can we improve on the situation? So they had a proposal, mitigating students' attrition and improving study program completion across gender in selected open and distant learning institutions in Nigeria and Kenya. The Nigerian institution was NOUN, and the Kenya institution was the University of Nairobi. The names you see here of the research team in blue are those of NOUN, and the ones in green are those of the University of Nairobi. So it's clear through the first stage of, of uh, assessment, but we couldn't proceed with it because we have a pending grant, which is one thing I like about NOUN. We set the rules, we follow them, so that nobody feels cheated, nobody is upset, nobody feels discriminated against. And now that the thing is not being funded, I have given it to some colleagues of mine at the Open University in the UK. So we are hoping we get one or two collaborators from the UK and make this research project even more international. We have other collaborations in place. We have collaboration with the University of Leeds in which seven, seven or four the, the yeah. University of Leeds are going to work with our students in what is known internationally as, as capstone projects. So we are even looking forward to making a presentation in July on it. So this is somewhat the proposal that has been submitted for that uh, collaboration. We have other collaboration. I attended the British Macology Society Conference in meeting we call it, but it's actually a conference in September. Uh, 20, this year, 2022, was sponsored by the British Pharmacological Society and the International Union of Basic and Clinical Pharmacology. And then at my expense, not now, sorry, now did not sponsor me to British Pharmacological Society. And although I, I told the vice chancellor and had his permission to go to the Open University and mention that I'm from now and see collaboration, it was fully paid, this leg of the tree was fully paid for from my pocket. So this is my host, Dr. Donham Bank, and this is me in the background of his office. We are attending a, a Zoom meeting. He invited me to participate in this meeting. I didn't say anything until the end, but when, I, when they finished, and uh, he said if I have anything to say, I was able to make valuable contribution which they found useful. But I visited their labs from 8 to 1 o'clock. I went through their labs. If you see their labs, if I've been to labs abroad, you will not know it's an open university. And he told me that the culture at the open university in the UK is conventional in research, non-conventional in teaching. And within the five hours I spent there, we were able to, to arrive at a joint antimicrobial research resistance project, which is ongoing now. We are starting a, an open STEM Africa initiative and then the Drosophila lab, which I couldn't visit during that time, but I'm in contact with the person in charge now, and it's going to help us set up our Drosophila lab. Then opportunities for seminars, for them to participate in our seminar program, and we to also participate in their seminar program. He is from the, he's the dean in the School of um, Health Sciences, so it's very similar to our Faculty of Health Sciences, and all of this can be done. And we are not just going to take from them, I'm not a taker, we are going to give them as much as we get from there or even more. In fact, if I let me not go into that story, but this is going to be a mutually benefiting, beneficial okay, have a little time, program between the Open University and the National 
Open University of Nigeria. I should say that UNISA has a very important role in being, in fact, UNISA is the first university that offered a degree program solely by open and distant learning in the whole world. So let us not be taking back seats as if we are, we don't know something or because uh, our Naira or bad governance or this and that has made us subdued. The students we have trained, the students, my students from ABU, and I believe from now going forward, they do well when they go out of this country. They may meet some initial challenges and be intimidated, but give them a few, a few months, five months, six months, they are top of their class. They do the exam at the end of the year. They are getting the best, the best uh, uh, grades for projects, for this course, for that course, for that course. But that's the story for another day. So I just spoke with this host for a few hours. He was interested in my joining their meeting. These are the four people that it was an online meeting. These are screenshots. And then they asked for my opinion, which I gave to them and advised them and they took the advice and pursued me to take part in their antimicrobial resistance program. There's a lot we can do and we don't have to be on the receiving side all the time. Then there's also a global initiative of which I've been a part. This started in 2021. Actually, before, just before I came to NOUN, most of the work was done while I was here. 34 of us together from across the world. Sadly, I was the only person from Africa. We are two, but the other person didn't continue. Don't drop out on the way. So we identified the core concepts of pharmacology education. It was a global initiative. These five concepts that all pharmacologists must know and understand, irrespective of whether they are going to be doctors, dentists, pharmacists, nurses, uh, physiotherapists, whatever. And the project is ongoing. It's a global initiative, initiative. And these are things that one can readily participate in, even from the open and distant learning section. I want to summarize and conclude that no NOUN has a checkered history. Established in 1983, suspended in less than a year, and resuscitated in 2002. 20 years ago, it defies what happens in other spheres of life. There's nothing wrong about that. And working at now as an academic has its challenges and opportunities. I'm going to mention some of that in a while. But mitigating such challenges and embracing relevant opportunities appear largely futuristic, but it's feasible. And examples of open university elsewhere and how they have evolved to effectively offer quality education and provide valuable feed forward for advancing education via distant learning. For example, at NOUN, it's possible. The rest of Nigeria and all over the world. I'm so excited and charged that I'm spending the last couple of years of my career at the National Open University of Nigeria now. And like I tell people, we are now, we are not adjective. So the migrant identity review, I should cover my face in shame because I couldn't keep up with protagonists, but I don't think anybody will be really be upset if I mention their name or show their picture. This was the avatar of our protagonist. You can see the hairstyle that is very similar to this hairstyle. And you can see that this clothing is just a camouflage for this one really. So this avatar is this person who happened to be Professor Mrs. Helen Okupo Panashi, and is this same academic, proudly NOUN, a pharmacologist, a boarding drosophilist, a guidance counselor, a collaboration champion, a gender advocate and practitioner, a mentorship promoter, a literary writer, poet, and comedian. Yes, I'm a comedian, but a lot of people don't know that. That is a story for another day. Now, let me show back again one of the slides I showed earlier about the migration basis. You check for yourself and see whether the protagonist now revealed as Professor Helen Panashi is indeed a migrant, a person who moves away from his or her place of usual residence, ABU Zaria, whether within a country or across an international border, <laughs> temporarily or permanently, like in this situation, and for a variety of reasons, is a migrant, yes. I'm an academic migrant. The type of migration that I'm speaking to, I've experienced all of them. When I was in face-to-face, -face, 
within ABU, I had done internal migration by changing my modality for teaching. Even before COVID-19, there was there is somebody, I want Mr. Abdul Mumini, and he was um, very instrumental in helping me use module and master all these things, struggling until I came to NOUN, then they would train me to facilitation and give, pay me for the data and the time. I say, oh, more, this is where I should be. So I've done internal migration, external migration from my primary discipline, right? I've done immigration from face to face. I've done immigration to ODL. I've done, I've countered some negative situation in counter urbanization. I've moved from Zaria to Abuja. I'm a career and academic migrant. I've moved on to greener pastures. I've joined family. I've prepared. I've gone for better studies, you know. And let me tell you, if you want to immigrate, you should prepare. As I was pushing, I tried a couple of times to come to NOUN before, before I made this last attempt that was successful. And then I prepared. I went back to school. I did PGDE and I did the higher diploma in guidance and counseling education. I did to escape conflicts. It was a response to adverse effects. And then all of the above were the reasons why I immigrated. Yes, are there consequences in immigration? There is. Whenever you immigrate, whether physically, emotionally, academically, or whatever, there are always consequences, like in more recognized migrations. So there are challenges and threats. I couldn't get something darker than this, but there's also happiness and contentment. What are the challenges and threats? I will just mention a few. Lack of orientation. When I came to, uh, to now, there was no orientation organized. Orientation is a guidance uh, 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 service. The counselors should organize the university, the registry, the bus star. They should tell us all this stuff about CMAs, uh, videos, SEMS, and so on and so forth. The high volume of work and long hours is too much. I hope management is hearing me. I work 12 to 15 hours every day, including weekends. And I don't think that is right. As a counselor interested in self-care, I think that is indeed not right. I think the university needs to employ more people. Then online project supervision. Oh, you see, I don't have time to tell the story. Online project supervision is something that I'm learning. And with the adaptation nurses, I actually did 100% online project supervision. And students that were trying to do hanky panky, I cut them out. And those that were trying to not to participate in the meetings, Ma, it's raining severely here. I said, listen, I'm from the South South. It doesn't rain severely every day. And you better go and get a rainmaker because we do a deploy technology. <laughs> anyway, I knew how to tackle overreactive students. And then the worst of all, I don't have time for this because I'm so engaged in doing so many things. Set 180 TMAs, who does that? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But having said all of that, now the National Open University of Nigeria is my happy place. So, and being here on the eve of my retirement is my happy time. This is my happy place, actually it's the same. So I you like our beautiful and serene environment, more varied courses to teach. I teach pharmacology, I teach biochemistry, I teach education, apparent lack of discrimination. I say apparent because some people tell me there is so, but I've not experienced any. I wake up in the morning, I want to go to work, which is not something I can always say for the past. Opportunity to study, if I want to. Opportunities to complete to compete for research grant annually and the operation of a lunar calendar. You know, most people, they are used to solar calendar, but in, in open university, I can tell you that the bursary unit uh, recognizes a lunar calendar. I hope you get it. If you don't get it, you can forget about it. So this is one of my last slides, some generic applications. So things you should avoid. Don't stop avoid staying when you should be leaving. I say this because what eventually made me leave ABU was in place 25 years before I left. I wasted a lot of time. Avoid leaving when you should be staying. If your own situation is in with face to face or wherever you are, fine. And stop the bedallying. That is the application. That is what I have learned. But I learned my own in retrospect. I'm telling you now what you should avoid and what you should imitate. Carefully weigh options at all times. 
attending conferences and participating actively. I see people collect that for grant. They don't spend, oh, don't even go, they will go and buy building materials. <laughs> if you can have a conference account, save your money, go, participate actively and utilize it. Spending your money and other resources to advance your career is a very good thing to be bold and courageous to implement good decisions. And when you meet people who supposedly are higher than you or know better than you, like the Open University or UNISA, just bring out your native Nigerianness and make sure that they know that you have a lot to offer. These are selected bibliography. I will just skip that. I like to use this slide these days because I remember, I'm thanking you now for listening. I remember the first time I saw Zuma Rock. If you are coming to, from Abuja, going to the north, you will think the road will stop at the rock. And it's just something to reflect in your private life. I'm talking to you now as a counselor. But when you get to the bottom of the rock, you will see that the road veers and navigates this side of the rock and continues. No problem is insurmountable. And no matter how the road is, you should never walk alone. You will never walk alone because this is a type of rock. It's not in our country. I got this from the internet, but this is authentic from Abuja. So long as you know your God and you are strong, you will do exploits. So this is actually the end of this, my slide. But I have a jackpot invitation to prospective students and staff alike. And I want to, it's just, it, it's actually like uh, two minutes or three minutes. It's just that it's a video and I can't show it here. So I will stop sharing, then I will share that video. Please, I, this jackpot invitation is to prospective students to migrate from wherever they are and come to NOUN, whether from a place of no study or from even a place of where they are studying now. And then, but for staff, oh, I put a question mark. I don't want to be accused of, of soliciting for people to come. But I, Helen, or people financially, I'm doing two people's job at NOUN. And although I'm very happy at the university, I will prefer a situation where I do one person's job and have time for life. Please, Permit me to sh share the screen thank and show you. Thank the you very much, Ma. I'll show you the invitation. No, I have to give you that invitation. I have to give you that invitation. It's, um, it's, it's out of this world. I have to give you that invitation. I have to give you that invitation. That's it. Okay, because here. Yeah. And I won't speak again. Once this invitation goes, it will be the end. I'm not saying anything again. It's one slide, it's a few minutes. And people are clapping for you already because it's a unique presentation. Appreciate you for letting us know the two sides of a coin. Uh, I, I am at Rubelo University and National Open University. And I must want to welcome our vice chancellor. I saw him somewhere there. Okay, it looks like he has left, but he was around for most of the discussion. And I also saw our deputy vice chancellor, uh, Professor. I think most of them have left. I saw them online. And one thing I want to start by commending uh, Prof. For Professor uh, Helen is that she really put the necessary crowd. She did the, uh, uh, the advocacy very well for herself and by herself. And everybody was on this platform today. So I must really appreciate her because when our presenters go to town they get to get the people to be online it is our own effort that made everybody come online today and we at a point we had about 77 and that is uh, great and i've seen so many people i've not seen in ages they all reported on this uh, zoom presentation because of the nature of the speaker so we want to appreciate her for going an extra mile to publicize this uh, presentation before we talk so much again, people have been itchy to talk. And the first person that uh, 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 indicated interest in speaking is Professor Akim Tijani, and followed by our uh, former Vice Chancellor, Professor Abdala Obadamu. Those are the two. The other person I'm seeing the hand of has no name, and we would appreciate if the person can put a name so that we can call the name. Thank you. So, Professor Tijani, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ellen Kwanache, for the brilliant, creative, innovative, pedagogical presentation. 
that uh, every moment learning was occurring for those who have ears to listen and to take note. And I took note. I have a whole page in a bulleted format. I have no question but comments uh, to validate this humility of uh, Professor Helen Kwanache and the presentation. The first comment was, you know, uh, historical fiction. He mentioned that. And of course, all of you will know that that should attract my attention. And I put a question mark, historical fiction? No, it is however a reality of self and the entire component that makes self a reality of what he has done and continue to do. And the fact that there is that humility even when you are a professor, director, executive, vice chancellor, or what have you, the humility per excellence was showcased and is a good model and modeling for upcoming early career uh, folks. She also told us about the multidimensional nature of migration that we have always been talking about. And she narrated uh, ethnogenesis and the consequences of many aspects of migration, including those of the academia, to us to learn. We all have our stories. And then hearing this art form from a scientist is so important, important to that nation, to that nation, Nigeria, where even agencies are clamoring for STEM at the neglect of humanities, social sciences, and what have you. There is no way, we've always been saying this, absolutely no way. I don't know who came up, how they came up with that. That is only STEM we are sponsoring. Oh, folks in peace and uh, whatever, uh, those in business at me, go and sit down, we don't need you. Professor Kwanache has just debunked that, 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 that facade, that fiction, and that is a fictional part of the Nigerian nation that we need to address. Uh, I think she also uh, validated the need for what I have been calling H STEM, that is humanities STEM. Humanities standing for social sciences, the humanities proper, and social and uh, business and whatever other aspect of uh, our academia that uh, is now being uh, propagated. She called herself protagonist, and I say, you bet, yes. But she's a pioneer, a trailblazer, a resilient scholar that deserve more than 10 first street, that deserve to be celebrated by students that she has reached all over the world. But when we do first street, we only do it for self-serving, for promotion. We even sponsor junior ones to write books about us, which is also sad. These are the kind of people we should be celebrating because she, we have the evidence of what she has done and what she has modeled and continue to do for us. And she also display an excellent way of pedagogical approach to teaching difficult content or courses. And I think I miss your class because if you started in 82, I started in 89. If I had gone to ABU, I probably would have taken or rushed to one of your general education courses. You started your career in 82 teaching. I started mine in 89, actually 88. So it means I will, despite my current status, will have, and I would love to take one of your classes or listen to more uh, lectures. That is why I woke up and I have not woke up around 5 a.m. today in vain. And I was monitoring 5.20, 5.30. I signed in 6 o'clock. I was there before the center started, okay? Because the topic is so, so catching. And seeing 70 something, I was so happy too, unlike the last uh, presentation. Let me end up by saying this, that I started clapping, 
not for self-identification, but because somebody clapped some years back at a public lecture where Professor Adamu was the vice chancellor, where Professor Bogoro was the chairman, where the president of Morgan State University, he was my employer, was a guest speaker. And that person that clapped for, he lost count. And I have lost count of clapping for uh, Professor Kwaneche. Later told me, can I see him now? And I said, who? He said, David. I said, when, sir? He said, now. That was Bogoro. That is the genesis of the Ted Fund Morgan MOU. And I'm emphasizing that because on slide 31, Professor Kwanichi says something, Kwanachi, excuse me, says something about partnership, collaboration, to improve upon what she's been doing. And I begin to wonder, oh, just two days ago, I had a meeting with the White House, and we're talking about partnerships. They were telling us about USAID, and that money that is always eating at the embassy, the same thing with the developed economies. And I said, we need to talk. We need to revisit what we started with Professor Joktan that my colleague never pursued. And I will be pursuing you. Uh, Professor Kwanachi Mail, the former vice chancellor, I'm not pursuing your wife for because I'm a young man. I'm pursuing her because I believe in what she's doing. So we will talk about these possibilities. And I want to appeal to the director of CMGS, please share the audio, particularly to registrars of other tertiary institutions. And I'll tell you why. When we started, when I was given the opportunity to be the pioneer of this center, and we started making waves, a registrar called me and he said, Prof, oh, are you with NOUN? I said, yes, sir. I said, I said why? I said, well, now I will start employing NOUN graduates. I said, hey, well, why? He said, I don't think they are serious. But with this center and what you've been doing, we've been watching. I never knew. He is still, I think he's finishing his time, or he has finished, a registrar of a federal university. I won't mention the name, but I can tell you that one of the 12 Jonathans, and I will end here by commending Professor Helen for a brilliant presentation. Excuse me. Learning no, no dull moments. Thank you very much. And the Lord will continue to renew your strength, man. You are blessed. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, comment. Lengthy one. And I think uh, Prof will be very proud for uh, you know hearing everything you have said. So over to you, sir, Professor Adam. Uh, thank you very much, Director, and uh, thank you, for Professor Helen, for your presentation. I feel very proud that actually what you are saying is that now one has done good, uh, and we have done. I I stepped on the shoulders of giants, uh, JGD, uh, Tenebe, uh, and then we did what we could to make it what it was, and now I hand it over to an absolutely wonderful, wonderful person, uh, Professor Pim Peter. So I'm very happy that. As a migrant, you are you are you are happy with the university. You are the only one that I know so far who has been able to indicate their their their, their happiness at being in the university. A part of the problem that we face in that uh, university is that it is considered a low hanging fruit. I call it a low hanging fruit because you need to see the number of applications that I receive as a vice chancellor for people to walk in now, not because they really care about the place but because they perceive it as a very nice place where you can chill, where you can relax, there is not heavy load and so on. At one stage, we had over, over 1,000 applicants and uh, we had all sorts of pressures from almost everyone. Everybody wants his wife, his brother, his sister, his uncle, his uh, housewife, his girlfriend, his boyfriend. I mean, people just simply want to come to Noun, not because they care about Noun, but because it's a low hanging fruit. Because uh, Noun is a place where you can just simply relax and chill. A lot of money is being given, a lot of money. Noun is the only university that gives certain months, the OTL allowance. Noun is the only university that gives you rice and oil allowance. 
Now, now in the only university where you, you don't have to come and nobody knows because you can say, oh, I'm working from ODL. But we had a, a very, very serious issue with a particular professor who refused to move uh, from Lagos to her faculty in Kaduna because she said that after all, she's in an ODL, so she can walk anywhere, it's virtual. And uh, we, we had a lot of uh, uh, to and pro and so on. So we have to step down on the recruitment of, of, of people, particularly so-called sabbatical. When you come on a sabbatical, you are supposed to add value, but people come, they say they want to do sabbatical in a study center, and it's just a play terrible. You cannot do a sabbatical in a study center because study centers are just administrative units. They are there just simply to administer uh, uh, admission of students and, and, and clarify things and do exam. You have to be in the headquarters. You have to be in the faculty. You have to be together with people and, and your colleagues. And we had a lot of problems with that. So yes, I, I know that I, I was one of those who was who stepped down hard on uh, academic staff employment uh, as well as uh, sabbaticals and so on. My chairman of council, Professor Okebukola, wasn't very happy with me, but he understood why I did what I did. So. Thank you very much, Helene, for, for appreciating the, the fact that uh, now has no discrimination. I like that. Uh, that's what stood out. Because you are passing a judgment on the last six years of now. That's, that's what you are doing. You are passing judgment on the last six years, and that's me. Uh, I and uh, Pemi together moved to where we are now. No discrimination. Why would we discriminate? This is a national university. It's a university that belongs to all Nigerians. Uh, so why, why should there be any discrimination? That, that shouldn't be. So we're very happy to have created a place that you feel that there is no discrimination. I'm just trying to determine where you are from, because you said your religion and your ethnicity is irrelevant. But to us, it's, irre it's irrelevant. Who want you to say, oh, I'm a Yoruba, but I'm not discriminated. Oh, I'm Hausa, but I'm not discriminated. I'm Plani, but I'm not discriminated. But it's OK, no problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's your privilege. One of the biggest challenges that that forced us to do what we did was in, in technology, pharmacology, sciences, and so on. That's very difficult. Let's be very honestly frank. You cannot effectively run all these high duty, high impact scientific programs through ODL, not in Nigeria. The reason is because this, this uh, disciplines carry with them a level of competency. You, you are supposed to acquire, acquire certain competencies. It's not, it's not like uh, uh, economics or history or political science or education where you can just simply read stuff and think like that. In this case, there is an expectation of a demonstration of a particular competency. And, and those competencies, I'm sure, I'm sorry, cannot be taught online. This is why we, we didn't really approve the idea of uh, faculty of technology. I, I can't see how you can do technology courses uh, uh, online. It's just simply not possible. Nigeria doesn't have uh, that kind of facility to do that. So in, with the regards to health sciences, we were challenged, you know, with all those uh, health things, like those laboratory nursing and things like that. Uh, and and uh, it, it was terrible. We wanted a situation where we can put people who are who are competent enough to work anywhere. And science gave us that particular challenge. We we wrote letters to our colleagues and other in other universities requesting our students to use their facilities, and they refused, including Bayer University, where where I came from. I mean, I, I started working in Bayer University in 1980, so I consider myself a, a very solid staff in the university. Even the vice chancellor, at the time I was I was in Noun, the vice chancellor of Bayer University was my student. And I wrote him and I asked him, can you allow our students in Noun to come to the faculty of science lab to work? And he repealed. He said that the ratio of usage of the laboratory is about 50 students per lab, and our students are hundreds, and therefore it's just simply not possible for our students to use that. And this is my university. The vice chancellor was my student. So those are the kind of challenges we face. So that forced us to create these mega labs, regional mega labs, where people can go and, and, and do the scientific experiment. We also toyed with the idea of people uh, using virtual labs. You know, so you, you experiment, and we record you, and then we upload it so that the student can see how the procedures have been done. Uh, so I'm not, I'm, I'm, pre I'm not pretending that now it doesn't have these challenges. It has. It's the challenges of perception. Professor Hakim Tijani talked about that. When we have top people like you coming in, then the perception of people of now changes. And they see that now is not just simply another year, year university, but it's an effective uh, university. And uh, COVID-19 lockdown has now created a new visibility for now. Before COVID-19, people were looking down on the university. I mean, how can you learn online? This is because of people's perception of, of what, what constitutes to be learning process. You have to be there in front of somebody. But COVID-19 uh, COVID has pushed people online. 
And suddenly, now is the toast. Now everybody is saying, now is doing the right thing. Now is doing the best thing. We have been doing this since 2002. So, and uh, I'm very glad that uh, Helene has uh, appreciated uh, uh, all that. So uh, thank you very much for that. I, to complement your lecture, I have just published a book by Common Goals of Learning uh, on ODL in, in Nigeria. And again, that's another methodological issue. A, a, a lot of people refuse to participate, refuse to cooperate. Uh, I, I sent letters, I said to vice chancellors, you know, many, many vice chancellors don't even bother to open their mails. Uh, but people are not really happy, uh, really to cooperate. But eventually I was able to do the research. Common Goals of Learning Canada has just published the book. I will send the book to the director and uh, she can now upload it somewhere where people can have uh, access to it. Uh, and that will complement what uh, Helene said about uh, open and digital learning. She's now saying, hallelujah, thank the Lord. I have seen the light. I am now in a place where I can see the light because you are touching lives more in now than in your ABU. I was in ABU and I know what it was. Uh, I, yourself, your husband were all virtually at the same uh, strata. I was in ABU from uh, 19, uh, uh, what is it, 76? to 1979. So uh, now that you are in now, you have seen the light. And uh, I can tell you, you are touching more people now than, than ever before. So once more, thank you very much. Uh, director, remind me of the book, which I will happily send. You okay, can share it. You might be interested. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Your kind guest yourself. Surely we'll put it on our website. And uh, I'm sure everyone will have free, free ride, free chance to read it. Thank you so much. I, I saw uh, Dr. Chukuma's hand up sometime. Is she yes. still online? Or yes, my director. Yes, my director. Good afternoon, Ma. Um, oh, good, good, afternoon. Good, afternoon to, good afternoon to everyone and uh, all the professors, my former vice chancellor, Professor Tijani. Good afternoon to all. Mine is to commend uh, Professor Helen Kwanashe, who is also a mom. Um, when I saw the invitation, I was prepared because I knew I was going to learn something. And honestly, I wasn't disappointed. In fact, listening to her was like food. So I just got fed now. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, one thing I want to say again is that I'm already envious of the, of the faculty, of the department and your faculty for having such a powerful addition in their midst. I'm really envious of them now. Thank you so much, Ma. Please and I also want to make... <laughs> Yeah, I also want to make a request. Number one is, I want to ask what happens to uh, the possibility of cross-faculty research where other people in the faculties that are outside your faculty can be accommodated in what you are doing, if not for anything, to be mentored. And even if it means just sitting down to listen to you, please, ma. I'm asking that if you can allow us have such and then uh, learn on that you. We, somebody like me will appreciate so much. And another uh, request also I want to make is, I don't know about others, but for myself, I also want to ask if, I, if the flipped classroom experience um, paper can be shared with me. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful request. I'm sure Prof will attend to it. Thank yes, you. Professor Sogolo, who gave me the permission to take permission from our speaker, is live here, and I'm happy. I can see his hand up now, so it's over to him, sir, to, to share his viewpoint. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Director. Uh, I thought I was not going to be uh, lucky to be part of this experience, but uh, as if I knew what was uh, uh, coming in, I had to um, paste him with my doctor uh, because it's a routine appointment. We finished in time, and I I started uh, uh, listening to the paper. Although uh, part of it I was um, mobile in my in my, my car, but uh, I still followed uh, a large part of the paper. So I apologize for not uh, you know uh listening to everything but i'm glad that i was able to make it and uh, uh professor kwanashi all i can say to you is that after listening to your very creative uh presentation i'm proud to be part of now 
And I agree with uh, almost you know, all the points that were made by Professor Abdallah Adamu. So I'm proud to be uh, part of now. And I agree with uh, Professor uh, Adamu that uh, now uh, I set the pace. And uh, you know, you see the transition to ODM may have been, you know, in part accidental in Nigeria. I say accidental because uh, it is a, it's a mode that is now trust uh, in the academic world, uh, in the intellectual world. And with mind, with creative mind like uh, Professor Panashi, you, you find that uh, now he's taking up the leadership in this uh, mode of intellectual uh, uh, endeavor. And I'm proud uh, to be uh, part of it. She has presented herself as a, a first a pharmacologist. And then together with uh, the, I don't know why she used the name protagonist, but she is with uh, the protagonist uh, and, and, and they have done wonders. Uh, you see, it's a, it's, a, a trans, it's, it's a new definition of migration. You know, uh, it's, it's uh, an intellectual definition and then combined with, you know, uh, a geographical definition and in a very creative manner. You see, she is like a storyteller, very fascinating and, and you want to listen and listen and listen. So I congratulate you. This is a very enriching and I'm glad I did not miss it. Congratulations, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for those words of encouragement. Looks like uh, there's no more hand up. I, I would like to call Professor Hanashi, but before I call her, I want to say, I thank God that she, remem she reminded us that she's a poet because I've always known her to be one. She didn't share her uh, poem on Drosophilia with us. She has a poem on Drosophilia. Maybe she will share it with us at another uh, presentation because I know that she's a poet. And then, um, of course, she mentioned something I find very challenging that is of uh, orientation given to staff in now. I think that is a, a point that uh, I, our administrators must uh, look into because it's really missing and people tend to be asking and maybe having some wrong information because they're not getting information direct from the administrative end. So we really need that orientation, not only for administrators, but for academic staff that are in the university. I think that is missing a lot. We just, we are left to find our way as much as possible. And then of course she mentioned staff shortage, academic staff shortage. I think everybody knows that uh, we all overwork, not only Professor Kwanashi, especially coming from a face-to-face -face system, she will really appreciate how much hard work we're doing now. And I just pray that in the coming year, uh, we'll be able to be able to have a new, more academic staff added to the system. That is my own part of my own contribution to this. And I particularly enjoyed her poem on women as therapeutic exiles. You know, it was very, very stimulating. I enjoy that very much. And I want to say thank you for that poem. I would like to have the poem. Uh, thank God it's already recorded. I will print the poem and put it on my door because I love it so much. Thank you so much. Now that I've said that, I want to give her the chance to make a general response and remarks to everything said here this afternoon. Over to you, Ma. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aneto. And then thanks to everybody, my colleagues, who have spoken and said such kind words, uh, both my mates and ones that are younger than me. In, in particular, I want to appreciate Professor Hakim Tijani. I've always respected your comments on this forum. And um, Professor Abdallah Uba Adamu, to, to also be part of it and to say nice things. It helps when good things are said about you. I'm sorry that the VC and the DVC did not uh, stay on, but um, nevertheless, you do have a recording, so I believe it will get to other people. I just met Dr. Nena Chuku not long ago. I was at her study center for e-exam monitoring, and uh, she became my daughter. 
because I believe in the total testing. The, that's why I have Cochrasm. Cochrasm is short for Helen Okuko Kwanashi, alumni, students, and mentees. Alumni or students have supervised. It's not compulsory for them to be in Cochrasm, but all my current students must be members. And then some people, I didn't even supervise them. They say, no, we want you to mentor us. So we have that platform. And I follow them even in their private life, writing references, uh, asking about, you know, stuff, 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 love and settling down and marriage and progressing and so on and so forth. So I get into, uh, into uh, 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 people's life as they would like to, me to have it. So Dr. Nena Chuku, you're already my daughter and we can work together. I will tell you that the facilitation project we did, we have extended it. We got, uh, we used some publication from Dr. Bello when we were doing that work. So we asked him if we can work together. Then, like I said, the cocoa of the facilitation in now is Dr. Adewale Adeshina. And we even interviewed him in our study. So we also asked him if we can work with him. So these are some people in health sciences. So I believe that there's a lot that you and I, or all of us can do together. And we should think of such uh, 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 projects that we can execute. Then the, the flipped classroom uh, uh, poster, I will send it out. Anybody that wants it, I will send it to them. And then uh, maybe we can put it on the platform. And I just want to say, we should not underrate, we should not be underrating ourselves and our students. When I went to that conference, I did not realize that my poster will be the winning poster. In many, in, in the BPS, for example, British Pharmacological Society, the American one at all, they have a panel of four or five people who go around and judge the posters, maybe every day or every half day. But in this conference, everybody votes. So it was particularly, you know, really touching that my poster was voted. And the comments they made was that they have had three conferences on the classroom, and they are all singing the praises. How did I come up with 14 disadvantages of fifth class? I said, I evaluated it. I asked this, that it was actually 21. But myself and the people that analyzed it, the ones that are similar, we pulled them together. And those were open ended questions. Those ideas came from my students. You know, I'm a very strict, where they say I'm a very strict person first of 12 children, and then I had seven children. I have to be strict now to survive. So my students, they don't find it easy with me. All. But when I heard in Doran that my students must be very smart to think of all these disadvantages, because when we go and call another person, they look at this, yes, this will be a disadvantage of, of a huge classroom. And they never thought about it in all those years. You know, it, it's, it's very gratifying. And I feel sad that maybe if I was in Nigeria, I would not have won. But they gave it to me and gave my dad the following year, the following uh, year, my husband and I went to Germany. We, we did a round table presentation there. And the, the, the award I got paid for our registration fee. So all these things are important and they pay off at the end. I'm very, I've been publishing in education since 1989. I have several publications. And now it's now I'm trying to narrow down to make you think with uh, guidance and counseling. So I'll be very happy to work with anybody. And uh, I'm not a lay about, you know, we dig it together, we roughen it together, and I'm sure we get to high places. I still have two years and six months. I'm excited and I know that God helping me, I can do much within that time. I'm a poet. I've written hundreds of poems. Initially, I was not um, keeping them. But now I keep them. I write mostly about science. I write about my faith. I write about nature. I write about love. My Konashi 20, this 2022 makes it 50 years we met. He's still my guy. We work together. And a number of my poems are about mm -hmm. him. So um, I can give my poems out. Oh, you know, nobody talked about being a comedian. I'm also a comedian. And if the vice chancellor will create that position, who knows? I may prefer to leave PMAs and go and do comedy. Comedy should bring a lot of money from the university. I think I would like to stop there directly. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know what? The last two words I want to pick again. 
a mother of seven children. Why will she not be tough? She has also added to the fact that she's a tough woman and a super woman, because I don't know how she was able to do academics with such a number of children. So she's super, really, indeed, she's a super woman. And the final one is Professor Kwanashi is still my guy. I beg, let us know, guys. Oh, me, I like that one. I like it's still my guy. So that is for us to copy too. So we know that the men are our guys. I like that slide. <laughs> Thank you very much, ma, for this wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation and uh, enlightening in all ways. Thank you. So Your invitation is accepted. And uh, I get that all the time. I had one last week. I even okay. had an offer to come and teach in one open and distant learning. I said, I'm a baby, I'm a baby open and distant learning person. And I'm not coping in, in uh, now yet. When I can deliver on all my things, then I will come and teach in your institution. And maybe I would just like to answer uh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian by the grace of God. <laughs> I'm from the south, south of Nigeria. I'm from Delta State. My husband is from Kogi State. I'm proudly Nigerian. I hate all the ethnic and religious uh, shenanigans going on around the place. So uh, that is why I don't like to, to bring that up front. But I'm a Christian and committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you so much. South South, another exposition that South South people are great from Delta states. Thank you for letting us know you through and through. Thank you so much. So on this note, looks like um, we don't have more questions. And of course, we, we really had a nice time because we are here for almost two hours. We've been here for almost two hours now. And so we would want to call it a day and say this is a very good way to end the year for us in the center in this uh, in the in the presentation seminar uh, webinar issues and then um, like i said at the beginning it is in january that we shall be having another presentation and we'll let you know because these few weeks three to four weeks we are going to tidy our house get things ready get others ready and uh, we'll come back by god's grace more uh, active by his grace. So for now, we are going to, the center is not going away. We are going to be in the center doing other jobs, but I mean the presentations. We stay for now and have a vacation to 2023. So we thank all of you who has made it a wonderful year. And I want to tell my other professors in now to please always be ready to present to us. Professor Kwanashe has done that. Professor Obieje has done that. Professor Suji has done that. And, uh, you know, and some others. So please, when we call on you, Charity begins at home. Always be there for us. And let us also showcase what we have in now. Thank you so much. And I want to say have a blessed day. Thank you, Professor Karashe. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. Bye. 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 See you next year by God's grace. Bye-bye. Yes. Mm.